Okay, everybody, here we are at the beginning of turn seven. And uh, again, the game continues to ratchet up. It's, it's just, I don't know, man. It's, it's getting really nasty. The first thing that happens down here in the south, Dylan tries to pull out of his forward position. He had some uh, shot some trains back here in, actually shot cows, back here in this creek bed. He pulled that off fine enough, but as he spent two movement points in his elevation hex, all my T-55s could see that. Not everyone could shoot. Some of them are out of optimum range. Some of them were disordered. Nevertheless, I did manage to smoke yet another position. It's really tank losses in this game. Pretty bad. He moved up to engage or to uh, occupy this town hex. I spent my very last Sagar missile. Blew up another platoon of anti cap tracks with infantry still inside. I then got a little ballsy. I tried to overrun him. That didn't work because I forgot his mortars were up here in overwatch position. Mortars double when using direct fire per Arab Israeli war rules, so that's a total of 18 plus mounted infantry fire on the hand tracks and some special infantry, 1967 forward. Long story short, this infantry attack got broken up pretty quick. I don't expect this uh, objective hex to last much longer because down the road comes uh, another 10 shot cows. This one little infantry platoon in the open is crossroads isn't going to do very much. My cat attack little mini battle continues to go on here, I've got them pinned down. Uh, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to win that fight. Now, down here, we have a miniature Valley of Tears going on. Where we have shot Centurions on high ground. Actually, one platoon of shots, one platoon of shot cows. And what was your fire plan for this uh, for this fire phase, Dylan? Uh, one platoon was going to engage uh, what I assume is a company. And then the other one is going to engage the other. So It would be a company in a Western army. Again, uh, each tank, each each is five tanks, so it's like three half companies versus so like a company and a half. So we basically have a full battalion down here. Uh, six is uh, 30 tanks. Yeah, that, that's a Soviet-style battalion. There. Okay, so 25, you are within half of your range. These trees don't block because you're on high ground. So you got 50 versus my 36, and 50 more versus this 36. So this is something you see in Valley of Tears. Uh, Damon, if you watch this video, you're going to know what I'm talking about. you got to pin down all the Syrian tanks before they just bum rush you. <laughs> you got to pin them down with their crappy morale. They might not all rally, and then you can pick them off at your leisure. But at the moment, you've got to pin them down. So, okay, at your, uh, at your leisure, Dylan, uh, which one do you want to shoot first? The northern one or the southern uh, one? We'll go for the northern one. All right. Well, here we go. 50 versus 36, one to one. A3. They are all three pinned down. Oof. Okay, then down here, one to one. A3. They are all pinned down. I was uh -huh. half afraid he was going to roll a one. Because, again, we're using, uh, I know I keep saying this, but uh, Tactical Command Middle East chart is a little different. A one does kill on the one to one table. So if he had rolled a one on either one of these, that would have been 15 tanks. Just That is true value of tears, badass, or just blowing up these tanks, outnumbered very badly. But that whole battalion is now pretty much shot up in its tracks. Yeah, you've definitely bought yourself some time on that one. So, anything else before we continue with turn 7? Uh, nope, nope. Stay tuned for more burning Syrian tanks. Continuing with turn 7, the next wave of the Israeli attack is coming in. So these 10 shot cows, two platoons, started off here in 1708. One, two, three, boom. They've now spent one and a half movement points. Actually, no, they can't spend move because they want to overrun, so they can't use the road movement rate while overrun. So one, two, they spent a quarter of their movement right there. Um, my ZPU 23-2s took their shot. I divide AA, so it's six versus uh, 15. It was a one to three attack. Even with the uh, Tactical Command Middle East uh, combat results table, uh, I didn't roll well enough to do anything with that. I was just trying to break up this attack a little bit. He's now going to go ahead and conduct his overrun. So this one platoon does get to do his uh, opportunity cat attack. He's not Egyptian, he's Syrian. So the Egyptian special rule for 1973 does not take effect. He only doubles, he doesn't triple. It's going to be my 12 versus his 30. That is, oh god, 1 to 3, right? Yeah. 1 to 3, subtract 2 from the die roll. This is important. Ah! 
Oh, hell no. <laughs> Six becomes a four. That dice is a stone cold atrocity, man. Go to hell. Another six just to be a All right. All right, so that's it for that uh, opportunity fire. Oh, God. All right, so now we've got a total of 50 versus eight is what? Six to one. Becomes seven to one. Subtract two from the die roll. Man, he's not here. He is dog meat. You don't even need to pick up a piece of plastic. He's just done. All right, I assume you have some other overruns coming in as well, I think. Yes, the, uh, the Super Sherman will come down and overrun. Oh my god, Super Sherman is overrunning infantry, except, oh no, they're disordered from my abortive cat attack. Yeah, that was probably not the best move, that cat attack. Uh, I tried to launch last turn. So here, there is no opportunity to fire, and there is no opportunity to cat attack. It's 22 versus 16, 1 to 1, becomes 2 to 1, because it's a overrun. Subtract two from the die roll. Subtract three from the die roll because he's disordered, and a double D will destroy him. So it's two to one. Subtract three from your die roll. Okay. What's that? That is a four. Goes down to a one. Yeah, he smoked. I, in fact, I don't think it's even survivable. I mean, it was fun to roll a dice, but at two to one, when you're subtracting three from the die roll, even if you're rolling a six, one, two, three, you're still scoring a double D. Uh, spoiler alert, that dice roll was almost superfluous. Uh, it straight up was superfluous. Um, I.e., they never saw a chance. So that's the way you're supposed to do it, folks. Bloodless overruns against dispersed targets, a little bit of fire maneuver there. He got, you know, the mortars went in, the machine gun fire went in, pinned down the guys, then the tanks overrun. No risk, no muss, no fuss, rinse, repeat. That's how you do overruns, guys. All right, so well done, Mr. Dillon. I feel like you're about to graduate. Arab is really more pansy with your school year. I think I've got a pretty good teacher, and uh, I think it all depends on what happens in the South. We'll see if we win or lose this one. Future stream, everybody. It's going to be the Padawan cage match. I'm going to get Rasmus. I'm going to get Yavasa. I'm going to get Dylan. I'm going to get Damon. I'm going to throw them all in a big pit of a Panzer leader, and I'm just going to see. Okay, I was just playing around there, like throwing dice, like in the dice tray, and I literally just rolled three ones. <laughs> Come on, man. I had this game one. I might still, but it's no longer nearly as I'm no longer nearly as comfortable as I was a second ago. He's only taking two objective hexes. I still I'm still winning on objective hexes, and he is running out of time. Yeah, we'll see what happens uh, at the end of this game going forward. Turn eight, we're coming down to the wire here, folks, and my friend Dylan is starting to unlock the secrets that is delaying armor from high ground, i.e. his own little personal Valley of Tears mini battle down here. Because what he's also doing is he's calling in his two batteries of M50, 155 millimeter housers. So they're disordered. They don't all rally because I'm only morale three. I'm only seeing certain tank crews. So like basically half of them rallied. And then artillery lands on those two hexes. And it's one to two attacks versus everything in the hex and gets to subtract one against every unit that is disordered. So he's disabling tanks, or I should say disordering uh, half companies, and he's also pulling up tanks that were more the uh, disorder. Now he's going to go ahead and he has his one platoon. He's literally outnumbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He just killed these two with artillery. Eight to one, because this guy can't really help. So this one platoon of shot cows is. I wasn't kidding. He's doing his own little miniature Valley of Tears. That's about the numbers that Kahalani was up against. Yeah, about 8 to 1. All right, so now he's got a choice. He doubles at this range because he's Israelis. 50 points. Does he put the 50 points against the uh, 12 for 4 to 1, subtract 1 from the die roll for being disordered? Or does he put 50 against 36 and subtract 1 from the die roll? The Syrian commander hopes he fails this roll. The guy making this video hopes he makes this roll. Because that would be an epic thing to put in the video. So, Dylan, before I announce that, which one are you going to choose? Uh, I think just because it's a desperate situation, I'm going to go for the three. All right, so 25 times two is 50 versus 36. That is one to one. You get to subtract one from the die roll. There's the column he's rolling at. He gets to subtract one. The secret sauce is that a double D counts as kills. So pick up your luckiest D6 and roll it. A four. Four becomes a three. Subtract one for dispersal. 
That was exactly what you needed. Oof. If you had rolled one higher, that would have been a dispersal, and then that's fine. But you, you rolled a natural four, right? Yes, yeah, natural, a natural four. four. Yes, red is a three because uh, my targets are dispersed. Now you're on double dispersal, and a double dispersal, the, the two Ds instead of the one D, means that a previously dispersed unit is destroyed. So somebody just won the Medal of Valor there. That one tank crew just killed, or that one that one platoon of five tank crews just killed 15 uh, T-55s. Nice. All right, guys, that's how it's done. Now go ahead and try to rally this other tank platoon that was disordered earlier. A five. He does rally. So, guys, that pretty much shuts down things in the south for the Syrians. And I wanted to show that here in the video because that's literally like a little microcosm of how the Arab-Israeli wars work, especially in 1973, especially the early part of the 73 war, is the shot cows or centurions, either shots or shot cows, either one, Israeli upgrades of centurions, we'll, we'll say it the easy way, get up on high ground and they just start disordering, 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 pinning down large numbers of concentrated Syrian tank units. What the Syrians are supposed to do there, and what I kind of failed to do, was to, to disperse. And this, so that you can't triple stack like that, or whatever. So there are counter tactics against this, where we're making Israeli tanks look a little OP here. I'm not, I didn't play this particular battalion as well as I should have. I should have spread them out a little bit. Damon will tell you, when he was playing Valley of Tears, he was up against this exact situation, except it was the entire map, times eight. He had eight platoons of shot cows, and I had, whatever that is, six times eight. I had like almost, you know, 50 um, half companies of tanks coming at him. The bulk of at least an infantry and a mechanized division with tank support. And the way I, I did, I did eventually lose that game, but literally by like two points. But the reason I was able to do as well as I was, you literally just carpet the map in tanks with only one tank platoon per hex, and you come at them that way that largely dilutes the effectiveness of Israeli tank guns. Because as good as, tank, as Israeli tank guns can get, they can only kill one at a time. Unless you're a fool and you triple stack them like I did. And yeah, that's kind of what happens there. So I'm still winning in hexes. I have three objective hexes, he has two. But in two turns left, because we're finishing up turn eight here, uh, I, I don't know how much longer I'm gonna be able to hold out. This one's gonna come down to the wire. Either way, the Israelis have lost a lot of stuff. Heavy tank units, F4 Phantoms, or I should say A4 Skyhawks, lots of infantry. It's It's been a bloody one for sure. So we'll probably have one more segment just to kind of show how the game wraps up at the end. All right, folks, here we are at the end of turn 10. The smoke has cleared, the dust has settled, the battle is over. Holy crap, man. <laughs> First of all, Dylan, great game. You want to talk through what you were doing those, those last couple turns? Sure, so the last few turns is basically just trying to secure the central crossroads and eliminate the, uh, was it 65th Armored Battalion in the south? Yeah, which whatever I was did. left of 65th Brigade, and there wasn't much, but there ain't nothing left of them now. <laughs> <laughs> so it was um, trying to get rid of them. Unfortunately, I was, I think, half a hex away from having a chance of taking the last objective, but I managed to basically wipe out the Syrian forces. Yeah, Syrian forces are more or less tabled. What do they have left? They have a command unit, basically a colonel with a radio. There's one infantry platoon, that's his whole army now, and uh, a, a SAM launcher that has nothing to shoot at, and two empty trucks. Oh wait, down here we've got two platoons of BTRs. So one, two, there's 15 actual combat vehicles, and maybe 60 men. That's literally the entire Syrian force left, out of what used to be the better part of uh, at least a full brigade. Everything else is either killed, dispersed, disordered, rendered combat ineffective. I mean, technically I've got two more units back here, but they're constantly being pinned down. I did manage to get lucky and blow up one half track back here. I kept pinning down with my off-board artillery, little bits of uh, Israeli armor down here. I think I stalled them just enough to where he couldn't develop any kind of pincer against this uh, objective hex. If this hadn't bogged down, I mean, I did lose an entire battalion. And again, I was on defense, so... I mean, two platoons of shot cows three or four turns ago coming up this road as these guys are coming down that road. That's the end of that objective, X, And that would have been game. 
So it's it's things to lose an entire Italian of tanks, but at the same time, when you're on defense, you're literally playing your time. And we wound up with a total of 32 Syrian units destroyed. It gives the Israeli 32 points. They did take two objective hexes. They have this northern town up here, and they have uh, this crossroads. So that gives them a total of 42 points. Meanwhile, the Syrians have killed 15 Israeli units, including uh, an A4 Skyhawk. It's two points per unit, so that gives me uh, 30 points. I still hold three objective hexes, so that is 45. So we're looking at 45 to 42. That is a very close game, down to three points. Over this does go down as a Syrian win. And uh, a little bit of vindication for poor Mr. Ariskany, who last time you and I gamed them, I got the crap shot out of me at Dark Star. So take that. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, great game. Yeah, yeah, it is a fantastic game. I'm surprised my little Jeep is still alive. Playing the Israelis in Arab Israeli Wars, it's a lot harder than it sounds. You know, a lot of times when I'm introducing people to Arab Israeli Wars, it's like, oh yeah, I'll play the Israelis, they're awesome, man. I get all the best tanks, I get killer airstrikes, I get... Yeah, you also have the burden of victory. You're always on the offense, and you're always outnumbered. The standard conventional rule is you have to outnumber the enemy three to one before you attack. The Israelis take one look at that rule and they say, hold my beer. I mean, they'll be outnumbered three to one and attack, and always win. And they have to win fast, and they have to win with you know, not taking many casualties. It helps when you're going up against, you know, like broken Syrian units, you know, the better part of the uh, Yom Kippur War. But at the same time, I mean, the clock, the casualties, the sheer number of enemy forces, I mean, yeah, you kill them whenever you breathe on them. Look, look, at, look at the Assad Brigade over here. So uh, what did you think about the pressure of the victory conditions? And uh, I mean, obviously you had the better force, but it was smaller and it was up against a whole stack of pretty challenging victory. Yeah, and uh, one of the hardest things is the entire Syrian force is hidden at the start of the game, so to, uh, you have to actually spot them. And for me, that normally meant moving out and then you're losing a platoon, because everything shoots at it. <laughs> yeah, now one so. thing that we did bring in this time, guys, is the, um, the spotting table for Tactical Combat Middle East, which does alleviate that a little. Um, when Panzer Blitz was first uh, introduced way back in 1971, it quickly got the nickname Panzer Bush because the terrain rules were inherently broken. They fixed that a little bit in Panzer Leader. They definitely fixed it in Arab Israeli Wars. Tactical Combat Middle East definitely fixes it because you're now able to spot vehicles at four hexes or less. Before, you couldn't do that. So games like Normandy Bokash just become absolutely infuriating, which I guess they're kind of supposed to, especially in that environment, but it, it can make the game feel a little cheesy the enemy's constantly, I fire, oh, I have split movement fire, I fall back, I displace, I, you, you, you can't spot me again. I do it again, I do it again. Meanwhile, I, you just keep losing platoons of Shermans over and over again. That's kind of how it was in 1944, but in other scenarios, it doesn't work as well. The train was a little broken. So we did bring in this new spotting table to sort of help fix that a little bit. I, it took me a little bit to get used to it. You know, the usual tactics of uh, pain relief. But it's always great to find a player who is comfortable playing the Israelis on offense. A lot of times, because the Israelis are always on the attack. Once in a while, you get like Beard Alpha John, you've got the Value Tears, you get these once in a while battles where the Israelis are on legit defense. And then just watch out, man. Israelis on defense are just absolutely sick. They're usually on the attack, which, yeah, where you run into the problems we were talking about before. Sagger ambushes. I was reading, uh, to do research for today's game, I was, doing, I was doing a little bit of reading of the Heights of Courage by Abigail Kahalani, and even on like the 14th, 15th, 16th of October, as the Yom Kippur War, especially in the north, is starting to wind down a little bit, it's goddamn these Sagar ambushes. We're going past a little bit of terrain, and boom, we get a missile on the ass. And it's, and the terrain is thick. The Golan Heights are not really a desert. You're going to find orchards, groves, towns, a lot of broken terrain or whatever it's 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 pretty choppy terrain it's not easy tank terrain by any stretch of the imagination especially once you get back into that series back so is there anything maybe you would have either done differently or um i think i would have liked to focus most all the force in the north instead of trying to do that pincer attack just come in get rid of the assad brigade and then come straight across the table yeah because this road here uh, i was kind of waiting for you to kind of you know what i'm just going to turn around here uh, one, two, three, four, five, 
six. Okay, there's gonna be one objective hex probably taken. Here's another one that's held just by a truck. Once you really outflank the Syrians and you kind of get behind them, it starts to uh, it starts to get really unhinged uh, for the Syrian player. One or two more turns, you would have had at least one more objective hex. I definitely screwed up my artillery in a couple places. I flat out forgot I had artillery on turn one. I did not stack this uh, platoon correctly, or platoon, uh, I did not stack this brigade correctly. I straight out threw away the Assad brigade. I actually made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> not to be too... And I forgot about interdiction fire. Interdiction fire is an ability that artillery is in to slow down units over broad stretches of terrain. Kind of like this, where you sort of lightly sprinkle terrain over a much wider area, and it can't do any damage, but it can force units to stop. It pretty much forces units to take cover, and it eats up time, it eats up the clock. But I forgot that rule even existed, because it's been a little while since I've played full Aramis Rally Force. Yeah, um, if you liked the game, I'm definitely glad you did. Uh, definitely appreciate it. Oh, absolutely, it was a great game. Had a lot of fun. All right, guys, so if there's nothing else, this is a Riskiny Jim signing off here on the SITREP podcast. Thanks very much, everybody, for your support. Please remember to uh, like, comment, and subscribe. If you like this video, we have a Discord. The invitation is down in the description of this video. Uh, we have a website. That link is also in the description of this video. Check us out. But for now, thanks one more time, Dylan, for another great game. This is a Riskiny Jim signing off, and Tango Micro Listening.